Greetings, friends. My name is Pavel Stelmach, and I'm glad to present for you the new episode of our daily wrap-up series. I would like to start the first episode of New Year with the goals that Ukrainians set for themselves in the 2023. The biggest goal is, of course, our victory, but it still needs to be acquired. And here the most important thing is to take small but much important steps. Therefore, Ukrainians now know they must support the armed forces in every possible way in order for them to achieve the borders of 1991. And after the return of all the lands, we have a lot of work to fix our lives. It is very important to achieve the immediate restoration of all democratic procedures and processes after the end of hostilities. We need maximum economic freedom after the war to restart the economy, create psychological, spiritual, institutional foundations for the return of all those who left and begin to create material foundations. In addition, it is necessary to introduce a transitional government in the territories that have been occupied since 2014. <laughs> I want to wish all of us one thing, victory, and that's the main thing, one wish for all Ukrainians. Let this year be the year of return, the return of our people, soldiers to their families, prisoners to their homes, immigrants to their Ukraine, return of our lands, and the temporarily occupied will become forever free, return to normal life, to happy moments without curfew, to earthly joys without air alerts, the return of what has been stolen from us, the childhood of our children, the peaceful old age of our parents. And then we will have a lot of work in international politics. We need to start the reconstruction based on the principles that were announced at the conference on the reconstruction for Ukraine in Lugano, Switzerland. After all, we need to develop partnership, carry out all the necessary reforms, and there must also be transparency and accountability, democratic participation and decentralization, the inclusion of business and civil society, gender equality and inclusiveness, sustainability. And before that, we should explain to ourselves and the world the impossibility of the empire's continued existence due to the constant threats it creates. And so together with the international community, start the irreversible processes of transformation of the Russian Federation so that it will never again threaten anyone. That is what victory is all about. This can be achieved thanks to the nations living on the territory of the Federation. Therefore, it is now necessary to support the national liberation movements of the oppressed peoples of the Russian Federation so that they put an end to its existence. We need to increase the number of all international allies on all continents, especially with the countries of the Global South, with which we began to actively work last year. Because in my opinion, Ukraine has a well-known brand and it is worth using it to attract investments develop experts and gain a position on the international arena. Wir fühlen mit den Ukrainerinnen und Ukrainern, die selbst an Tagen wie heute keine Ruhe haben vor den russischen Bomben und Raketen. La guerre revenue sur le sol européen après l'agression russe, jetant son dévolu sur l'Ukraine et sa démocratie. Russia launched a barbaric and illegal invasion across Ukraine. I'm more convinced than ever that Vladimir Putin is going to lose in Ukraine and that the Ukrainians will achieve their destiny to be a free, sovereign and independent country. Ukrainians also want to join the EU and NATO. However, to be honest, in 2023 it will be difficult to achieve this. Therefore, we will leave this for 2024, as well the reformating of the United Nations, although the aggressor country should be expelled from the Security Council as soon as possible. And you know, all the plans that I just talked about must be done so as not to go crazy. We should still support each other and join forces to fulfill all these points. And while we are making plans for 2023, we haven't even had time to celebrate his arrival. Not to mention the fact that the majority of Ukrainians met the new year not where they planned. Some are in the trenches, some are far from their homes or even their homeland. And many Ukrainian. Civilians and military did not survive 2022. The Russians don't want to leave us this year either. The Russians started New Year's shelling on Saturday evening. A 22-year-old girl died in Khmelnytsky. A 46-year-old man died in the capital as a result of the shelling. However, according to the Russian mass media, they attack combatants, military facilities and NATO instructors. Tell me, does this hotel in the center of Kyiv look like a military barracks? It is impossible that the Japanese journalist taught Ukrainians. I think 
No, because simply Japan is not a member of NATO. However, the Russians did not finish greeting the Ukrainians with the evening shelling. Already closer to midnight, Iranian drones were launched. Therefore, people had to spend New Year's Eve in bomb shelters and basements. While sheltering together in the middle of the night during Russia's heartless attack on Ukraine, diplomats from the U.S. Embassy in Kyiv took a poll of our favorite quote of 2022. The winner, no surprise, was Ruskiva Yanni Karabel. In general, on New Year's Eve, as a result of work by the air defense forces of the armed forces of Ukraine in cooperation with the air defense of other components of our defense forces, 45 strike drones were destroyed. 13 aircraft in 2022 and 32 in 2023. They failed to spoil the holiday for Ukrainians. The Russians did not stop on the second night too. They are trying to damage our energy system again, or where they are aiming. We won't find out because our anti-aircraft defense is working and only a few of drones fly to the planned targets. According to the air defense forces, on the night of January the 2nd, 40 kamikaze drones were heading for Kyiv. In particular, as a result of falling rocket debris on the roadway, the balconies and windows on the third, fourth and sixth floors of a nine-story residential building were damaged. In addition, the defenders of the sky destroyed two or one ten operational tactical UAVs and a guided air missile H-59. However, can this somehow be compared with what happened in Mokoyev and Kherson? In a city recently liberated by the Ukrainian armed forces, the Russians damaged the building of a children's hospital. Already this afternoon, the Russians drove from tank to the central market in Bereslav, and this is not the only city that suffered from the invaders. In the Kherson direction, the civilian infrastructure of the settlements of Havrilivka, Dutchany, Kacharivka, Respublikanets, Bereslav, Lvove, Ivanivka, Ingulets, Ingenerne, Antonivka and Kherson were damaged by enemy fire. In order to destabilize the humanitarian situation in the temporary occupied territories of the Kherson region and to force the local population to the so-called voluntary evacuation, the Russian occupying forces are firing mortars to Aleshki, Holopristin, Plavny, as well as country settlements between the mentioned settlements. I would like to point out that on New Year's Eve, the Ukrainians launched several of their shells at the locations of the Russian military. And you know, these hits show the difference between us and the Russians. Currently, the Russian mass media is spreading information about the destruction of the college building where the mobilized Russians were. Of course, the propagandist media do not say the truth number, and they cannot, because the distribution of such information can lead up to 15 years in prison in Russia. And the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation said about 63 dead. They cannot admit their losses. They had no losses at all until September. I wonder how many were injured here according to the Kremlin's version. After all, according to the Strategic Communication Department of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, 400 occupiers were killed and another 300 wounded as a result of the strike on the concentration of the occupiers. At the same time, there are no civilian victims, only military ones. This is military skill, not launching your missiles in all directions with the thought that they will hit somewhere. Russia plans to spend a third of its income on military purposes. The following year, $143 billion were allocated for the needs of the military, special services and the police. British intelligence calculated this. However, during the preparation of the budget, very optimistic calculations were made for the expenditure and revenue parts of the budget. What can we say if the former president of Russia, Medvedev, expects the price of oil to be $150 per barrel, when it costs half as much now? And if it goes up in price, then the set maximum prices for energy resources in Europe will simply not allow buying energy carriers. The sanctions are already having a significant impact on the Russian economy, and the Kremlin is running out of funds to wage war. James O'Brien, U.S. State Department sanctions policy coordinator, said this. According to him, out of 630 billion Russian funds in banks, 300 billion is frozen, and Russia spends the rest. We think it spent well about 80 billion in just the first months of this war. And I'd add to this, now you see cuts in their budget. You see they have lost their most valuable resource. Maybe as many as 900,000 Russians have fled the country in response to the mobilization, the sanctions and the war. And in general, they are much less able to produce at home what they need in order to fight the war most effectively. James O'Brien, head of the Office of Sanction Coordination, during the special briefing. 
Washington believes that the Russian economy will shrink by at least 16% in the coming years and by 20% by 2030. And in order to continue the war against Ukraine, Putin will have to significantly increase the burden on the rest of the budget. And despite the fact that Russian TV channels say that sanctions do not work, input substitution will fix everything. Russian experts understand that everything is not so rosy. The Center for Macroeconomic Analysis and Short-Term Forecasting calculated that oil and gas revenues to the budget of the Russian Federation may decrease by 15 or 30 percent in the near future. The main reason is changes in the energy markets, the so-called global energy transition. Revenues from the export of hydrocarbons, even in the best case, if the sanctions are lifted in the near future, will decrease by at least 15%, compared to the level of 2021. And in the worst case, if the sanctions war continues and the global crisis turns out to be deep and will take on a structural character, this compression will make up about a third. The last month has been very difficult. The budget is unbalanced. The budget deficit is enormous. The Central Bank of Russia, through the banking system, which is still alive, receives money for lending to the budget. That is, there is no money. International auditors reveal the shortage of these reserves, which were raised. That is, the hour of financial Armageddon is near. Let's hope in the first quarter of 2023. The general crisis and the slowdown of the world economy will hit Russia even more. The head of the IMF predicted a recession in the EU and a slowdown in the world economy. This year, the world's three largest economies, the US, China and the EU, will slow down, and it will happen simultaneously. Therefore, the coming year will be more difficult than the last one, believes Kristiana Georgieva. However, we will continue to hear from Russian TV screens that everything is fine in Russia. It cannot be worse, because there are not so many civilized goods outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg anyway. That concludes our today's video. Thank you very much for watching and stay tuned for future videos. Subscribe to our channel and goodbye.